Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Sham Sriram. Um, and thank you for everyone who is joining us today on Zoom. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to this discussion about refugee resettlement in the United States and why Muslims are not involved more. I want to thank Brother Munir for helping me organize this great program. And I also want to thank my wife, Lizette, who is actively involved in the MCC community and all my stepchildren who are very excited to be here, mashallah. So I want to start with a few questions. Is that correct? So a few questions or goals for this evening. So the first is um, I want to focus on the United States and our historic response to immigrants and refugees. Then I want to look at predicting possibly how Presidents Biden or Trump, if he's becomes president again, let's see, will respond to the potential of Palestinian refugees. And lastly, I want to recommend a few ways for Muslims to be more involved in refugee resettlement. Now, before I continue, I also want to mention that I have written the first American textbook on refugee resettlement, which will be published uh, in early July, inshallah, with Cognella Academic Press, which is from Solana Beach, California. I am an assistant professor of political science at Canisius University, which is in Buffalo, New York. And I just drove to California a few days ago, cross country. I'll be here all, all summer. I'll have my email address at the end of the talk if anyone wants to stay connected. Um, and yeah, my goal really in all of this is everything is for the sake of Allah. I'm trying to draw more attention to refugee resettlement in the United States among Muslims and talk about ways for Muslims to be more involved. I also want to acknowledge, I just learned recently, I learned just today, that there's an organization called Al-Misbah in Sacramento, which is in the process of applying to be a national refugee resettlement partner and agency, and if so, will be the first national Muslim resettlement agency in the United States. So this is definitely an organization I want to study more and follow more, and I think they will give us a lot of opportunities to get more involved in locally and nationally as well, inshallah. Okay, so I wanna start with this, is why should we care, right? So there's five reasons why I think this topic matters to Muslims. The first is there is a long Islamic tradition of hospitality um, reflected not only in the Quran and Sunnah, but also in how we think about how Islam has spread throughout the world I am a Hindu revert to Islam, uh, someone who grew up in the United States and India, but I call the United States home. And I think my own journey is very much reflective of what we think about this tradition of hospitality, which is not just short-term hospitality, but also long-term. There's a long history of Muslims and the idea of hosts versus guests. And I think that's something I should mention. I also want to mention that this is an important topic because it's actually quite understudied. As we'll discuss, even though refugee resettlement is something that involves every level of the federal government, state government, local governments, etc., it's something where we don't see a lot of Muslim voices. In fact, that's one of the biggest problems is even now in 2024, refugee resettlement work is dominated by Christian-based agencies. And there's a few not secular ones, but there's really not enough Muslim voices. And I want to see more Muslims involved in this work. The other reason why this matters is this is a great opportunity, not only for Dawah, but for us to challenge Islamophobia. Instead of blaming organizations for neglecting Muslim voices, I believe that Muslims should be at the forefront of refugee resettlement work, not just to help other Muslim refugees, but to help everyone. The same way that I think we should be more involved in healthcare, not only to provide services to Muslims, but to provide an Islamic standard of services to everyone, which itself will challenge Islamophobia. And lastly, I think everyone knows that Muslims can't really agree on anything. I mean, moon sighting is just one example, but I really feel like if we come together on the topic of refugee resettlement, it's a great way to unify kind of the disparate Muslim voices that we have. Okay, so a little background on this. And I also want to mention, I'm sorry to mention this earlier, if you have any questions, please submit them in the chat. Um, Brother Munir is kind of uh, moderating the questions, and then he'll let me know if there's any specific questions, which I'm happy to answer. 
happy to go off script and discuss really anything related to this topic. And of course, I'll provide my email address. Happy to continue this conversation more after today as well, inshallah. So who is a refugee? I want to be clear that the defini definition of a refugee was set in the, by the 1951 United Nations Convention on the Status of Refugees. And it's a very specific definition. Um, and I'll just read some of it out loud is, a refugee is someone who, quote, owing to a well-rounded fear of persecution for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his nationality and is unable or owing to such fear, is unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country, etc., etc. So I want to acknowledge a few things here. First, it is well known that this definition is quite dated. It has not been updated in 73 years. Now, why does that matter? Because if you pay attention, you'll see what is not mentioned here. Sexuality is not mentioned here, right? Gender is not mentioned here. Um, climate change is not mentioned here. Gang violence is not mentioned here. And there's a lot of other similar topics as well. So it's important to acknowledge that this definition is dated. It needs to be updated, um, but it hasn't done so as well. And the other part I want to mention is that most refugees are unable to return to the country of origin, although not all. It's, it's pretty well documented that, for example, former refugees from Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, Serbia, etc., have been able to return home. But most refugees come to the United States with the assumption that they'll never be able to go home. Similarly, I also want to mention that these days we hear a lot about different terminology. I want to be clear. An asylum seeker, for example, is someone, so all refugees are asylum seekers, but not all asylum seekers become refugees. And what I mean by that is seeking asylum is asking another country to accept you because you are, feel like you cannot return to your country of origin and you're being persecuted, right? So the thing is, when someone comes to the U.S. border with Mexico, for example, and wants to be taken in by the U.S. as a refugee, they may be seeking asylum, but they may not be granted asylum. And then often they may go home or they may just try to slip into the country. But if you come into the country illegally after an asylum case has been denied, it's unlikely you'll ever receive asylum. And then in essence, you become undocumented or illegal. And there's quite a large number of people in the U.S. who are here illegally who sought asylum and didn't get it. Conversely, most people who come to the U.S. as refugees legally have sought asylum from another country, have, been, have registered with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, have been granted asylum uh, in the United States, and then come to the U.S. and then immediately are allowed to work in the U.S. and are immediately on the fast track to citizenship, usually five years for refugees. And if you think that's a long time, I can tell you that there are people who have been in the U.S. for 20 years who still are not, do not qualify for um, citizenship. So I want to acknowledge that. Okay, I also want to acknowledge and mention uh, an important individual whose name doesn't get discussed that much, but should be, and that is Rafael Lemkin. Rafael Lemkin was a Polish lawyer whose parents were both murdered in a concentration camp during World War II called Treblinka. And why we're talking about him is he coined the term genocide. And these days there's a lot of discussion about the Israeli genocide of Palestinians. And I wanna be clear about something, that not to make a political statement, although I am very passionate about this topic. If you look at Lemkin's definition of genocide, then it is very important to note that he, this was written in 1948 before the Refugee Convention. And in response to the Holocaust during World War II, and very much it's important to acknowledge that the idea of persecution, the idea of a group of people being ex exterminated because of their race or religion was very much in line with what Lemkin was thinking, which was in turn connected to the definition of what would be a refugee. And I want people to really ponder that because there's so much discussion now about will Palestinians be refugees? But something I want to acknowledge is that they are definitely the victims of genocide, but a lot of Palestinians do not want to leave their homeland. It's not that they're clamoring to leave and be resettled elsewhere, and that's just something I want to acknowledge, and we can talk more about genocide later. 
I also want to acknowledge that even before World War II, there are two other genocides that never get discussed much anymore. And they actually are very brutal, very depressing situations. And you'll see in the picture, the one on the left is the Armenian genocide, um, which even Hitler infamously said, who remembers the Armenians? And the picture, and that was about 1915 to 1919, I believe. And the picture on the right is an even lesser known genocide, which is that of the Namo and Herero people in what is modern day in Namibia by the Germans. And sadly, this is actually the first German concentration camp was in Shark Island in what is now Namibia. And this is where they, quote unquote, perfected the methods that they was used later during World War II. So I want to acknowledge these in groups. Um, okay, so I have a question. Um, and uh, Munir, this might be interesting to do. Um, so the question is, what are the top five refugee hosting countries? And why don't you just throw some answers in the chat and we'll see if anyone has any answers. Well, I would say the United States and Canada. So you say, so you say the US and Canada, okay. Is anyone else? Uh, not yet. Germany. Someone at, said Germany, okay. Good guess. Um, anyone else want to jump in? Okay, so um, thank you to whoever said Germany. It's a good guess. So here's the answer, Munir and others. So the top five hosts are Germany, right? Pakistan, Uganda, Colombia, and Turkey. And uh, so I'll tell you, um, in the history of refugee resettlement in the U.S., the U.S. has only accepted just under 3.6 million refugees between 1975 to now. Turkey is currently holding more than the U.S. has ever taken in. Right? But you wouldn't know that, and I don't blame you because I think the rhetoric we tell ourselves in the U.S. is that we are the bastion of immigration and all these other things. Now, the other thing I want to acknowledge is if you look at these numbers from the UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, you'll see that on the left that almost 70% of all refugees originate from just five countries, Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, Sudan, and Myanmar. And the reason why that number also matters is often the countries that have, are the biggest hosts are the ones that are bordering civil war or conflict zones, right? So we don't really hear much about Venezuela, but the reality is there is a huge Venezuelan diaspora of refugees that are now in Colombia. Similarly, there's you know many, many millions of Afghani refugees who are in Pakistan, right? Um, similarly, a lot of people displaced from Myanmar or Burma are in Bangladesh, so so on and so on. Same thing, Syria to Turkey. And then just to give you an example of some other places that are have a lot of refugees, I mentioned Turkey, um, Jordan, you have the West Bank and Gaza, and this was from two year, three years ago, so these numbers have to be updated as well. But you can see that you know the countries that we most often think about as hosts are not necessarily the ones that are reflected here. And again, there's a reason why the numbers are different is because different organizations collect data. Sometimes there might be a few discrepancies. Um, and then similarly, again, like this is from also UNHCR and you can see the top 10 countries of origin of people displaced across borders and how that's affected by where the conflict is happening. So let's switch to now, how does the U.S. resettle refugees? So it's basically an interesting process, right? What happens is, is that the federal government signs what are called memoranda of understanding with refugee resettlement organizations, right? And these are, and we'll talk more about who the RROs are in the U.S., but they are mostly, as I mentioned, Christian-based organizations, some secular ones as well. And then what happens is that, I should actually say before that even happens, based on the 1980 Refugee Act, which was signed into law, the author was originally, um, at that time, Senator Edward Kennedy, and one of the 14 co-sponsors was then Senator Joseph Biden. But what happened was is the president sets a refugee ceiling, 
Um, it should be at least 50,000, although Donald Trump was the first U.S. president to lower the refugee ceiling. So let's see what happens in the future. Um, and then what happens, as I said, the federal government signs memorandum of understanding with these different organizations. And essentially, for example, one might be in a memoranda with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, who then in turn say, okay, we can accept 5,000. And then what they do is they will then work with, they will first allocate a certain number of refugees to their local partners. Maybe they'll tell their affiliate in Chicago or Clarkston, Georgia, or Unica, New York, or San Leandro, California, can you take a thousand people from Bhutan and in turn we will give you money for them. Um, and then what happens is, is that the local chapters then work with state and local agencies and then the refugees client receives services from governmental and non-governmental um, institutions. So that's kind of a very brief understanding how refugee settlement works, but we're going to go into more detail today, inshallah. And then this is also important to know is that this is as of last year, you can see that across the United States, there are a number of different agencies involved in doing refugee resettlement work. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, they're often color coded. Um, the only two on this list that are, to my knowledge, not religious based are Hyas, which was originally founded as the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, uh, but I believe now is a Human Immigrant Aid Society, and their focus is on um, helping everyone. I want to make that clear. And similarly, the International Rescue Committee uh, helps everyone. I mean, all of these agencies have a very diverse clientele of refugees that they help from many different countries. But again, as you'll notice, there's no Muslim organization in this list at the moment. Um, and then you can see there's so many different things. And then there are other smaller organizations that may not be represented here. And just to give you a snapshot, um, yes, I have one audience member, mashallah, uh, Sister Yasmin. And then I have a Zoom presence. So, um, so um, UCSB in the house? Yeah, so... Um, I want to just mention, for example, that this is just a snapshot of what refugee resettlement looks like in Los Angeles, right? So these are all Orange County-based organizations. And you can see, like, and this is based on the work of Stephanie and Nawain, I want to acknowledge. But, for example, you notice that, you know, there's Armenian Evangelical Social Service Center, Evangelical Catholic Charities, Catholic, there's Jewish, there's Protestant, Evangelical. And then some of the organizations are secular. But again, you know, some are what we call, some people say VOLAGs, volunteer agencies. I prefer the term RRO. Some of these are called mutual assistance associations, which are kind of community organizations within certain groups that help each other. But again, even in Los Angeles, in Orange County, there's no Muslim organization on this list. To my knowledge, the only two we talked about, uh, Al Misbah earlier, but there's also, I believe, one in San Diego that is Muslim-based, but it's local. Um, okay, my next question to anyone in the room or on Zoom. Which president has accepted the most refugees on average per year? Okay, Nixon. Sir? I'd say Eisenhower. Eisenhower, anyone on Zoom? Faithful moderator. How many people are watching? Okay, woohoo! Mashallah, mashallah, mashallah. Um, it's actually, ready, drum roll. George H.W. Bush. And. <coughs> He was only president for four years, but on average, he accepted 118,000 refugees per year, okay? Next is Carter, then Clinton, Ford, and then going on from there. You can see where Biden is. It's pretty low. Um, so I want to be also acknowledge this is that we are way past the point where we can keep saying Trump, Trump, Trump about refugees. President Biden has had a terrible record when it comes to refugee admissions. And we'll also mention later that one of the programs he's been pushing for is 
private sponsorship of refugees, particularly from Afghanistan, what are called sponsorship circles. So we can talk more about that later. Um, but yeah, and does anybody want to guess why it is George H.W. Bush? So, <laughs> sorry, I was trying to get your attention. Anyway, I'm live. That's right. Okay. Um, anyone else want to get what you want? Well, probably the Cold War. Yes, absolutely. The Cold War, right? So what happens is, is that, and you can see on this next graph here, right, is that you can see refugee admissions over time is all all over the place, right? So you see, so and also, you know, Yasmin, you asked, you said Nixon, right? Okay. The reason why I'm, I, it's interesting you bring that up is so Nixon resigned in 1974, right? And then Gerald Ford became president. And then what happened was, is that Ford, even though he's only president for like a couple of years, he's actually one of the presidents we often most positively associated with refugees, right? I think Nixon had too many other things going on, like spying on the Democratic Party and Vietnam and all of that, maybe. But as you can see on this graph, you can see that, and those of you watching on Zoom, you'll see that it's all over the place. So let me explain some of the numbers here. So you can see that you have this 150,000 in 1975. So that's the end of the Vietnam War, right? So you have a huge refugee exodus displacement from Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, etc., right? But then immediately it craters. And the reason it drops so much is what happened was the U.S. was essentially overwhelmed by refugees, right? There was no policies in place at the state level. You had a lot of refugees being resettled in states like Texas, and the communities were frankly overwhelmed. And then there was a lot of resistance. Like I think within a very short amount of time, thousands of Vietnamese refugees got resettled in Galveston, Texas. And that resulted in a lot of local people getting annoyed because they love my jobs and this. And you have to imagine if people have just served in the military fighting in Vietnam, they come back and now Vietnamese refugees are there. It didn't go well. So it craters. But then what happens is in 19, late 79, Congress, as I mentioned earlier, signs the Refugee Act. Jimmy Carter signs it into law in 1980. And immediately, refugee admissions again jump to a record high, right? In that, those first few years under President Reagan, essentially. And then, as you can see, it stays pretty strong. There's a pretty big drop in the mid-80s. Does anyone want to, want to guess why refugee admissions dropped so much um, around 1983, 84? Anyone want to guess? Anyone on Zoom want to offer any answers as to why? We have 20 people on Zoom. <laughs> so, um, so it drops because of some pretty nefarious reasons. Munir, did you get any responses now? Okay. Um, so one reason it drops is there was a pretty savage stereotype at the time that um, – Immigrants from Cuba and Haiti were bad for business in America. I mean, that's the basis for the movie Scarface, right, is refugees from Cuba, Dominican Republic, etc. But actually, another reason that happened in the early 80s that a lot of people don't talk about is that some of those immigrants were actually blamed for AIDS. Uh, we don't talk about this. In fact, an early name for AIDS was actually 4-H. Does anyone know what the 4-H stands for? Okay, hemophiliacs, homosexuals, okay, um, Haitians, and um, what did I just forget the last? Wait, Haitian. And there was one more H, I'm sorry, I just forgot, it'll come to me. But there was that stereotype, right, that um, AIDS was associated with these groups and they must be avoided. It's a true public health sadness, right? So then if you look on from this, Refugee resettlement kind of slowly peaks again. I mentioned George H.W. Bush. You have the dissolution, end of the Cold War, the end of the Soviet Union. It peaks again in the early 90s. Anyone know what was happening in the early to mid 90s that would have sparked more refugee admissions? So you have the Yugoslav Civil War. Yugoslavia is now six different countries. It's a great trivia question, right? Um, you also have the Rwandan genocide. And you just have, again, like the remnants of the Cold War dissolution kind of peaking. Then, as you can see, refugee resettlement kind of strong, and then it dips again 
um, in the late 90s and then craters after 9-11. Slowly rebounds again till it's probably at its highest point um, in 2016-2017. Then you have the presidency of Donald Trump. Um, you have a sp slight rebound from President Biden and then you have where we are right now, which is pretty low historically. So, okay. My next question for everyone, what is the only state without a refugee program? I think you know the answer because of a sticker on my car. Um, anyone? Munir, Yasmin, anyone on Zoom? What is the only state without a refugee program? Vermont. No. Why are you hating on Vermont, man? Bernie Sanders is from Vermont. What are you doing? Why are you picking these states? Okay, I'll give you a clue. It is the least populated state in the union. There are more people in Oakland than in this entire state. No, you're close though. Wyoming. Wyoming has never accepted a single refugee. So, um, and they would like to keep it that way. And in fact, I have a sticker on my car that says Wyoming isn't real, which I bought in Casper, Wyoming. So they would like no one to move there, okay. Um, unless I guess you're into petroleum engineering or something, right? So here's an example just to show you about how the diversity of refugee resettlement in the U.S. So besides Wyoming, stubbornly in gray, you can see that there's a couple of things I want to mention. The first is that in most U.S. states, the government, the state government runs its refugee resettlement program, right? So we see that obviously in California, Washington, the states that may come to mind. But I do want to acknowledge here that sometimes people have a tendency to look at resettlement as a partisan issue. But you can see here that a lot of quote unquote red states run their resettlement programs, right? The thing is, in my own research, what I found is that, for example, Georgia, which is one of the states that always resettles many people, may have a more conservative government. But what they do is, even if the state runs refugee resettlement, the state refugee coordinator may have very little power, and he may give up some of that power to local agencies. But conversely, a state like California, the state refugee coordinator is very involved, right? Um, and then the other thing I mentioned is that in four U.S. states, Oregon, Iowa, Missouri, and Arkansas, there's a public-private partnership. So the state works with a private agency to run the resettlement program. And then finally, in a few states, um, as you can see all over the place, it's a private program or what they call a, ref a, a re replacement designation, which means that the, um, the state has designated one private agency to do all the resettlement work. And in many of these states, that is Catholic Charities, but not all. Okay. I also want to acknowledge that there are some states that are called Wilson Fish states. So Wilson Fish is named for two U.S. senators who wanted um, – or members of Congress who wanted – that they, they wanted refugee resettlement. They, okay, here's what I'm trying to say. Essentially, some states believe that refugees get too much money. And I want to acknowledge that when refugees first come to the U.S., there's the, first of all, there's a myth in the U.S. that refugees get like housing for life. They get 90 days worth of housing in most states. Okay, three months rent, three months unemployment assistance, food stamps, other benefits. They may get cash when they move in. But that's only good for 90 days in most states, okay? Some states have decided that, you know what, we don't want to give them as much money, but we're going to make it easier for them to get jobs. So less money so they can become more self-sufficient. So those are what we call Wilson Fish states, which are the ones represented here. And these states, they provide less financial resources, but they're more focused on quote-unquote self-sufficiency or getting people to, into jobs quicker. And I'm going to bring that up later again because this is a place where I feel that Muslims can be more involved is helping refugees get better jobs. Okay. How many refugees come to California and from where? Right? So obviously this is a pretty broad question. But let me ask it this way, right? Um, let's see how to ask it this way. Um, what countries do you think refugees come from? Who wants to guess? Sir, what countries do refugees come from to California? Mostly. Yeah, just, just what's one country that you know refugees Afghanistan. come from? Afghanistan. Okay. Munir? Iraq. 
Okay. Is that? Okay. Syria. Okay. All correct. I'm not sure, what, but Nicaragua, I'm not sure. I'll find out in a second. Um, so first I want to mention that just to give you a snapshot, I took these numbers today from the State Department, that between October and April, um, there were 55,000 approximate refugees resettled in the U.S. and California received the most, okay? Then Arizona, then Florida, then Illinois, then Georgia. This is kind of the usual top five, although sometimes Texas is in the top five. Sometimes New York is in the top five, et cetera, but those states are always in the top 10, usually Ohio, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, it's kind of standard, right? And just to give you a snapshot, these are all the countries from which, uh, so there, I think everyone got one on this list, uh, but then in addition to that, so I have an asterisk next to Syria because that's the most that have come um, among the California refugees, uh, the most came from Syria, but as you can see, we're talking about you know, 30 different countries here, including countries that I think sometimes we may not realize have refugees. For example, the Republic of Georgia, Moldova, Pakistan, um, Burma, Algeria. Um, but yes, people will still come from all these things. And again, remember, based on the definition we discussed earlier, it's based on persecution, fear, a well-founded fear due to issues about race, religion, etc., right? So let's switch to another topic that I think is important in the scheme of things is do Americans support immigrants and refugees? This isn't a rhetorical question. You know, my parents are immigrants. I'm the first person in my family born in America. I think I take this topic very seriously. That might apply to some of you in this room as well. Um, but I want to just show something, just to give an example of how complicated this is. So for example, I know this graph looks insane, right? This looks like someone... This looks like an EKG, right, from someone who's had a pretty rough day, right? But what actually this is, is that I took 100 plus polls that were done asking Americans how they felt about refugees from 1938 to 2022. And this is how it's all over the place, right? Now, what makes this interesting for a couple of things is that if you look over time, the mean level of support, right, is only about 42%. And the mean level of opposition is 51% which is for almost every poll ever conducted in the U.S. about refugees, fewer people have wanted refugees than, um, uh, no, fewer, yeah, f less people want refugees compared to, again, that myth we tell ourselves in America, we love everyone. In fact, if you look at those early years, 1938 to 40s, that was asking Americans about Jewish refugees, right? Americans didn't want Jewish refugees, and yet we tell ourselves these myths that everyone was always welcome, right? Now, here's an interesting thing I want to point out. Look at the last data point on the far right. Okay, does anyone know what group that was asked in response to? Like Americans were asked, how much do you support resettling refugees from this place? Ukraine. Yes, that is the highest ever. Gallup has acknowledged that no American support for Ukraine has, there's no, no country has ever received such high support. Now, some of you may ask why, some of it's obvious, some of it's not. I'm going to say, I'm not just saying this as a person or as a Muslim, but as a professor, Ukrainians are perceived as white, okay? Even though many Ukrainians are Jewish, including Zelensky, their president, right? I believe is Jewish, right? But it doesn't matter. They are perceived as white, so they get a thumbs up, right? Um, and the sadness that we know this, I'm doing this in other research as well, is that the same people in the United States and Europe, when asked about Syrian refugees, or Palestinian refugees or other groups have a much less level of support. Even though, the, so it's, it's something very fascinating and also depressing that a lot of people globally have what we call selective hospitality, right? And I started this conversation when I started about 35 minutes ago about the idea of Islamic level of hospitality, that for us, there's not short term versus long term, right? Whether it's the Sunnah or Quran, we have a long history in the deen and our communities about hospitality. Right. And I think that's something important to acknowledge. Um, so just to give you an example of a snapshot. The other thing I want to mention is that what makes it difficult to look at public opinion data about refugees is that the polling is reactive, which is polls are never asked ahead of time. Like, how would you support what they ask is reaction to one group?
And as you can see, this is a sample of the different groups that have been asked polling questions. So European, Jewish, English, Hungarian, Indo-Chinese, boat people, Cuban, Haitian, Kurdish, Kosovar, Syrians. So why is that difficult? I'm just curious, why do you think it's difficult then to compare data or look at data over time when there's so many groups? Like from a scientific perspective, why is it difficult to make a comparison? So what do you mean by that? Right. To different groups, right? Hundred percent, right? And also, so that's a great answer, public health scholar, of course, right? But the other thing to acknowledge is that why these questions are sometimes very loaded, and what I teach my own students is survey questions can be manipulated, right? How you ask a question can actually create very different results. So the reason I'm asking that is when you ask Americans how much do you support resettling Syrian refugees? The challenge is, is how do you separate how Americans feel about Syrians versus how Americans feel about Muslims versus how Americans feel about refugees, right? And the problem is because you can't disentangle that, then you get into some complicated things here. Like most Americans probably don't even know where most of these places are, but it may be reactive to what they know in the moment, right? So that's why public opinion polling is great, but it's also difficult on this topic. So, um, yeah. Um, and then I mentioned Ukraine. The other thing that I want to acknowledge is something that just happened last December. So in December of last year, former President Donald Trump, recently indicted Donald Trump, um, was at a rally in New Hampshire and said at the rally, quote, immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country. Okay, this happened in December, just six months ago. And anyone who is even if your own family did not come as immigrants and you've been, I mean, besides Native Americans, everyone has come to the country as an immigrant or through indentured labor or servitude. But I want to acknowledge that, especially for recent immigrants, it's really hard to see this, right? That he would say that they're poisoning the blood of this country. Does anyone know what is the term for the ideology if you believe that some immigrants are good for America, but not all? Does anyone know what that's called? Anyone on Zoom? Right? What, that you prefer some immigration over others. I mean, yeah, but it's called nativism, right? So when you call someone a nativist, it's a very specific term. And it refers to someone who wants one type of immigration, usually from Europe, over other types of immigrants. Why? Because of the idea that white immigrants blend in, assimilate better, etc., etc., right? I um, mean, there are even people now, may Allah protect us from all of these folks, who believe that immigration is bad because immigrants have more babies. Does anyone know what that theory is called? It's resulted in some big mass shootings. The guy who, who killed a bunch of people in New Zealand believed that immigrant Muslims were having too many babies. May Allah grant Jannah to all the shaheed that day. Does anyone know what that's called? It's called replacement theory. People actually believe that immigrants, brown people, black people are having too many babies. And this is the very height, not just of racism, but of all white supremacy, if you believe that, right? So why am I bringing that up? Because I ran a national poll in January through Verisite, and I asked Americans how much you agree with this statement. And 40% of the people I asked in a national survey agreed with President Trump, okay? So this isn't just any data. I wrote this question, I submitted it to Verisite, they ran it, and this is pretty depressing to see, right? That if you look at the country as a whole, right? They did a sample of a thousand people nationwide, right? 40% approximately, right, a little bit over than 40, agreed, agreed somewhat or agreed completely with President Trump that immigrants are destroying the blood of our country. And that should surprise, or maybe it doesn't surprise us, but it should alarm us. Okay, because why am I bringing this up? Because my bigger point here is I want a robust refugee resettlement program in America, but I also want to acknowledge that one of the biggest places of resistance right now is from Americans themselves. Not just those who associate with Trump, although that's a big connection, but what Trump has done in the last 10 years is that he has convinced Americans that immigration is bad. 
And why is that problematic? Because now most Americans don't know the difference between refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants. They just don't want anyone to come to America. And then that is bad for all of us, right, in many ways. Um, I also, um, for those of you who know anything about regression, I also ran a regression, and there's a highly significant relationship between voting for Trump in 2020 and agreeing with his statement on immigrants ruining the blood of the country. So also pretty depressing. I also want to show you some things. I asked people in the poll, which of the following groups is the best fit for America? And again, I'm not surprising that uh, a good number of people said that, but 25% said that Christian and Catholic refugees would be the best fit for the country. Um, so a, a good number of people, 68% said that religion does not matter, all are welcome. Um, so some people might argue this is the real story here, right? That people are saying, you know, all religions are okay. But I would argue that it's pretty alarming that even here, even Jewish refugees is very low, right? I mean, if you look at the whole sample, right, only 2.4% said that they welcome Jewish refugees. And I think that's an important, interesting thing here. And the last thing I want to share from the poll that I think is interesting is I asked, is it too easy for immigrants to become American citizens? And I don't think it's easy at all, right? In fact, anyone here has ever applied for naturalization? The N-400 form is 20 pages long, okay? It is no joke, right? And yet, here again, there's a big belief, I think, now in America that it's too easy to become American. 37.9% right? of the people I polled said that they thought it was too easy. Okay, so I want to mention a couple more things about this, and before I continue, um, do you want some of my coffee? Okay, all right. So when I lived in Spokane, Washington, a few years ago when I was a professor at Gonzaga, I was on the campus of the University of Idaho, which is only like 90 minutes from Spokane, and I saw this flyer on a, on a wall right on campus and the this is a flyer on their campus for the Patriot Front which is a white nationalist organization that wants basically all benefits to go only to white people and to nobody else and this organization marches and they have members and I even went on their website and I wanted to just give you an example of one of the so this is from their website they quote Washington and Hamilton and take a lot of people out of context, but I wanted to share one of their quote-unquote beliefs. So this is on their website, right? Quote, those of foreign birth may occupy civil status within the lands occupied by the state, and they may even be dutiful citizens, that yet they may not be American. Membership within the American nation is inherited through blood, not ink. Even those born in America may yet be foreign. But like myself, I was born in Evanston, Illinois, but for this organization, it's not enough. Right. So I think this is alarming and we should all be alarmed. And I have to tell you, when people say, oh, you know, they talk about the KKK and other groups, forget about the Klan. That is very old school. There are thousands of anti-immigrant white nationalist organizations in the United States, and they have proliferated because of the Internet and social media and other things. And they exist. Now, what is their influence? Hard to say, but I want to acknowledge that they exist. Pretending that they don't exist doesn't help us, right? And they are also actively very much generating campaigns against Muslims and other people as well. Okay, I want to acknowledge that as well. It's, it's pretty terrifying. I also want to talk a little bit about what we learned from Syria, right? And what I mean by that is when there was a Syrian civil war and the situation in Syria is still not resolved. There's almost 7 million people displaced from Syria and who are in Syria, what we call IDP, internally displaced people who can't go back to their home but have not crossed a border. So what happened at that time was, for example, most people said at the time that Syria was the worst refugee crisis of our generation, comparing it to other crises in other places, including Afghanistan, Iraq. Kosovo, Chechnya, etc. And what happened in the United States? Does anyone remember? What was the response at the state level to Syrians? It was terrible. Yes. Yes, a lot of people said a lot of bad things against Syrians. And in fact, Donald Trump wasn't even president at that time. He was running for president. And he ran on a campaign... Uh, that if we, if, if, if we let in more Syrian refugees, they will cause more terrorist incidents. He ran. Like, this was his big platform. 
And the question I would ask anyone here and on Zoom, how many terrorist incidents have occurred in the U.S. in the last 10 years due to a Syrian refugee? There's none. Zero. Right? Conversely, does anyone want to tell me and go guess who the FBI have said is the number one domestic threat in the United States? White nationalists. Right? So it's not, why are we looking overseas? The problem is in our backyards, but we don't look at it because they look like everyone else. Right? Um, and to, to Munir's point, here we go. Right? All the states in red, these are states where the governor said we will not take in Syrian refugees. So you look at this list, this is not a partisan thing as well. One of the states on here is Michigan. Michigan has the largest Arab population in the United States. And their governor was like, we can't take in, it's too much of a threat. The largest mosque in America is in Dearborn, Michigan. Right? But they were like, we can't take in any Syrians. So you see a mixture of Democrat majority and Republican majority states. Then you see... Um, uh, Washington, Colorado, Pennsylvania, Vermont, Connecticut said they would take in Syrians with increased vetting. And then some states um, like Minnesota, Oregon, California at the time were kind of non-committal on this. They didn't say anything. Yes? Yeah, so that's a great question. Thank you for being the only one to ask questions. Mashallah, your parents are awesome. Um, so I want to say that, so I'll say it the best way possible, right? America has, like, some Muslims are okay in America and some are not. Now, that doesn't make any sense, right? Because, but the reason is because sometimes America says we like some countries and not others, right? And I'll give you an example, right? America, all our presidents have had historic, sorry, um, a little bit distracted. Um, historically, the U.S. has had a very positive relationship with Saudi Arabia. Okay? Very positive, right? Like, going back many presidents has been that relationship, right? So even after 9-11, when all 19 hijackers were Saudi nationals, right, or most of them were Saudi nationals, the U.S. didn't go to war with Saudi Arabia, right? We've had a very positive relationship with them. So does that answer your thing is, so at the time it was about Syria, but honestly, like sometimes the U.S. likes some countries and sometimes they don't. I'll give you another quick example. The U.S. and Iran used to be best friends. BFF, right? What changed? In 1979, there was an Islamic revolution. So then the Ayatollah Khomeini took over, right? And then the U.S. was like, we don't want to be friends with Iran anymore. Who's Iran's best friend? Iraq. So then the U.S. became friends with Iraq. Till Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Then the U.S. was like, Iraq is bad. We don't want to be friends anymore. The U.S. is like, is like a high school senior trying to figure out who's taking them to homecoming. They are so petty. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's kind of what happens in the U.S. And just to give you an example of some numbers, right? So we had 12 million people displaced by some accounts. You know, 4 million of them registered with the UNHCR. The U.S. took in about 1,800. Okay, just think about that by in terms of numerical precise. Same thing, look at this. In 2018, the U.S. took in 11 Syrian refugees. 11, right? I think between us, we know 11 Syrian refugees, right? Or 11 Syrian people. But so other countries were doing the heavy lifting at this time, right? And then you can see that how many other countries, and I'm, by the way, I should have mentioned this earlier. If anybody wants my slides, email me. I'm happy to share a modified version. I can also send it to Munir. He can share it as well, inshallah. I don't own this material. I'm just sharing it for everyone. Um, so you can see that. Now, what did we learn from Syria I mentioned? So one would think, right, that America is like Syrians are bad. We don't want them in America because they're Muslim, right? And yet, just a few years ago, and we're seeing it now also, the U.S. now suddenly wants Afghani refugees, right? They didn't want Afghani refugees 20 years ago or 15 years ago, but now they do. So what's changed? So for example, you see quotes from Governor Larry Hogan from Maryland saying, the US stands ready and willing to receive more Afghan interpreters. Uh, the governor of South Carolina says the, they're, they're welcome. The governor of Utah, the governor of Georgia, everyone. So what changed? What changed is that the Afghanis who the US is taking in now served in the US military. 
right? Or were, worked as interpreters or in the military with people. So now they're not seen as bad anymore. So it seems that for the U.S., for Muslims to be good enough to come as refugees, they have to be patriotic, right? But then that becomes a big question. How do you measure patriotism, right? And what's also sad is that it takes serving in the U.S. military for the American government to be like, you're one of the good ones, right? So I think there's a lot of hypocrisy here for sure. I also want to mention a couple of things, and I'll just... Uh, mention a few a little bit more and then see if anyone has any questions also also Munir is this still 8 30 or yeah approximately okay so I want to mention a couple of things is that um, I've been asked this before and the first I want to acknowledge that I do want the US to accept Palestinians in the future but I just don't see it happening for a number of reasons this is not about Trump or Biden neither of them are supportive of Palestinian people but there's a deeper question here a lot of the Palestinian refugees are Christian, right? There's a decent number of Christian refugees. But the U.S., I, I haven't seen American churches who are always so gung-ho about taking in Christians doing a lot for Christian refugees in Palestine. So what that means is that it's not about being Christian. It's about being the right type of Christian. And that, to me, is the highest form of hypocrisy, right? That they're not even accepting Christian refugees because they're Arab. So it means apparently if you're Arab... And just think about that. I saw the best tweet that said, just think about it this Easter while Israel is bombing the Holy Land, right? Like Bethlehem, Nazareth. These are all in Palestine. These are Christian homes and churches being destroyed by Israeli weapons that were built in the U.S. and paid for by the U.S. by Christians. And I'm like, what are we talking about here? So it's not really about helping Christians, right? It's about punishing people for being Arab. So that's pretty depressing. One second. I'll come to you in a second. The other thing I want to mention is that I also don't think... Now, I do think that the U.S. will take Jewish refugees from Israel. They've historically taken Jewish refugees. Not surprising. But what is, is going to be unfortunate is we, we do know, and if anyone accuses me of anti-Semitism, A, you're wrong, and B, I have the numbers to back it up. I can prove, and as most people can, that when Jewish refugees came in the past they often received better benefits when they came in the U.S. from other organizations. So what that also told, if you don't know, is that not all refugees receive the same treatment even when they come to the U.S., right? And if you want an example of that, just go to like um, Stockton, Merced, etc., Merced, California. You have a large Hmong community. Hmong have been in California since the 80s. And they still often rank very low in terms of socioeconomic benefit because they historically have suffered challenges that other refugee communities did not. Yes, ma'am. Oh my God, that's like the thing that one of them was like an upset in Palestine. Yeah. Like how Israel is bombing the stuff. Isn't that like the story? Yes, it's safe for now, but we don't know what's going to happen in the future. What I was saying was that, that's a good question, what I was saying is that there are churches, Christian churches in Palestine, that even those have been bombed by Israel. So I'm just saying is that like even religious things in schools and hospitals are not safe for anyone, which is sad, right? So, um, and then the last thing I want to mention about this is in general, when you look at refugee resettlement, refugees want to leave their country. I want to be clear. I don't think Palestinians want to leave. They don't want to leave. They don't want because they know two things will happen. If they leave, A, they're not going to be able to go back. Right. Once they leave, like you see that now we have there are Palestinians in Jordan, Palestinians in Lebanon, Palestinians in Egypt. They can never go home. Right. It's very difficult to go home. And the second thing is they're also, in fact, kind of being forced out anyway by the settler movement in Israel as well. And I also want to mention this to anyone who doesn't know this on Zoom or in person. The, U the settler movement in Israel is almost not completely, but heavily funded by American churches. Right? Because it's the holy land. And it's, it's it's just some scary kind of topic. So let me focus on the last part. And then if anyone has any questions, you can ask me on Zoom as well. Um, how can Muslims become more involved in the resettlement process? And again, I want to acknowledge what I said earlier is that, alhamdulillah, al -mis, uh, misbah is a uh, Sacramento-based refugee organization that is in the process of becoming the first refugee resettlement organization in the U.S. that is Muslim-founded to help refugees. 
And when that formally goes through, are you part of that also when you're? Yeah, of course you are, mashallah. Um, that, they, that will be a, a, a landmark organization that we can all then kind of model and follow. So here are some ways that I think Muslims can be involved. Is first, we have to acknowledge our responsibility, right? It says in the Quran that on the day of judgment, you'll be judged for what you did and what you left undone, okay? We all have a responsibility when it comes to refugees and not just Muslim refugees, right? Like we can all be involved and help people get settled right? It shouldn't just be about helping Muslims because we know that a neighbor, according to the Sharia, is 40 houses in any direction from our house, okay? So we should feel compelled to do this work, okay? Second thing is where I see Muslims really get involved is helping out with housing and job placement. And I'm going to give you some statistics about this, inshallah. The third is sponsorship circles. My wife and I were just talking about this, which is one of the things the Biden administration has done is they want regular Americans to take the responsibility on of sponsoring refugees and people fleeing political violence. So now you just have to form a circle, you just need five people, and then the five people in turn have to raise a certain amount of money, and then you can help someone come to the United States. They may only come on a one-year visa, uh, humanitarian parole status, um, and then you may have to help them apply for permanent status, but it is a way to alleviate the burden on the federal government for private individuals to get involved, happy to share information about that. I also think, as I mentioned, what they're doing in Sacramento, but I think we all can probably do better in terms of organizing local refugee resettlement organizations. I also want to acknowledge that this masjid, mashallah, MCC, is very involved in refugee work, um, and not only in collecting money, but helping refugees get resettled and doing all those things. So there is that capacity building. But I also want to acknowledge that where refugees often struggle is getting culturally specific services. For example, I think there's an interesting analogy here between resettlement and foster care, whereas you have a lot of children in the foster system who are Muslim, but they don't have Muslim hosts, right? So similarly, we see that we have refugees who are Muslim who may get a caseworker who cares about them, but isn't aware of their needs. And I'll give you a quick example. When I lived in Spokane, Washington, I was working with some Afghani refugees. I mentioned they were former military, whatever. And I went over to one brother's house and his kids were all eating Rice Krispie treats. And I was very shocked, right? And I said, brother, this is not allowed, it's haram. And he was like, what do you mean? He said, my caseworker gave me this. I said, Rice Krispie treats in America are made with gelatin, with marshmallows. And the marshmallows is from pigs. And he said, I, I didn't know. My caseworker gave it to me. So in this case, the refugee resettlement caseworker didn't know. Okay, first of all, may not have even known that Rice Krispie treats are made from marshmallows and that marshmallows in general are made from pork. May not have known that. But then they didn't even think that maybe this was not a food. So I think we need more people because I feel that inshallah, if we have more Muslims involved in this process, they'll be able to do those things better. Another example is I live in Buffalo, New York, when I'm not living here, and I do a lot of resettlement work there, may Allah accept. But one thing I've seen with a lot of the house setups is no one, everyone stocks the houses with tons of toilet paper. And no one thinks about providing anything for istinja. It doesn't even cross their minds. They're like, oh, they're Muslim? And then I'll go to like a Bangladeshi store and buy what they call like lota or whatever and bring it over. And then they're like, oh, we never thought about this. And I'm like, something so small, but something that we know matters to everyone, right? Um, and then lastly, establish the first national organization. Alhamdulillah, they're doing it in Sacramento. But we need to be more involved in this. And I just want to share a few things about housing and job placement. So these are the 10 cities with the highest and lowest cost of living in the United States. And you can see that in the top 10, right, for highest cost of living, you have San Francisco, LA, San Diego, Honolulu, Seattle, Boston, New York City, DC, etc. And then you can see the lowest cost of living, Albuquerque, El Paso, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, Cincinnati, Buffalo. Can someone raise their hand and tell me what is the essential difference, like what connects the lower cost of living cities versus the higher cost of living cities? What's the, what's the, what's the obvious connection between the circles in red versus the circles in blue? Yes? No, no, that's correct. What I was, that's correct, good job. 
What I was asking was, is that what is unique about those red circles? That is also true. Where are the red circles? That's what I should have asked. I'm sorry. Boston. Mashallah. Washington, D.C., maybe. Um, what did you say, brother? I think John was going to say the thing. No, but just before that, what did you say was the thing that... Yeah, coastal. Okay, so what I was trying to get at, you were correct, mashallah. What I was trying to say was that all the expensive cities are on the east and west coast, right? But look at where all the cities are. This is probably hard to watch. Where all the cities are, the low cost of living, they're all in the Midwest. They're all inland, right? And that's important because, any, I mean, a lot of us in this room are, are immigrants or the children of immigrants. When most people hear about America in India or Libya, right? or Mexico or Afghanistan, it's New York City, Los Angeles. And then they get here and they're like, holy smokes, I can't afford to live here, I need to move somewhere else, right? Um, similarly, for example, the largest housing shortages, number one is New York City, then LA, then Miami, Chicago, Houston, Dallas, DC, San Francisco, Atlanta, Philly, right? So these are the 10 cities that have the biggest housing shortages. And then the cities that have the lowest are Louisville, Buffalo, Raleigh, Rochester, Cincinnati, Richmond, et cetera, et cetera. And again, what's the similarity, right? These are often the cities that are the highest cost of living, also have the least housing available, right? I mean, I've heard in New York City, in some areas like Staten Island or Manhattan, there is so little housing available that sometimes the wait time to find a new apartment is years, what I've also heard is the reason why there's so little housing in some of these cities is because there's rent control. So what the landlord will do is they'll say like, well, I'm not going to rent out my apartment if I'm only going to get $500 for it because the rent control was set in the 60s. I would rather it go vacant and empty rather than only make $500 a month. So you have landlords. And I also want to mention, I really, may Allah forgive me for saying this, I'm not in a masjid. We need more um, halal Muslim landlords, okay? I know in California there are Muslims who own properties, who do not treat tenants well, who do not take care of buildings properly. We need more Islamically minded, sunnah following Muslims to own properties and rent to other people. It's a problem not just in California, nationwide, okay? Just want to hold people accountable, inshallah, right? Um, and then just to give an example of national housing shortage, you can see that in a good amount of the U.S., okay, there might be an adequate supply of housing, but it may not be necessarily in areas where people want to live, or it may be cost, right? This is not taking into account cost. And you can also see a good amount of the U.S. is severely undersupplied with housing and also um, undersupplied generally. And the last thing I want to mention is just the cost of living, right? So this is from Bloomberg, and this shows the cost of living across the United States. The darker the color, it shows the number of hours someone has to work in order to afford um, the cost of living. So for example, Marin County, California, is considered the most difficult place in America to live for a family. Um, because for example, here, like what it says, the, the living wage is $30.31, but the minimum wage is $9, which means to live there in Marin County, you need to make up $21 per hour from excessive sources of income, right? And here's the really depressing part is, according to Bloomberg's City Lab, there is no county in the United States where a minimum wage earner can support a family. Not a single one. Just on the minimum wage can someone support a family. So that's why so many of us now Muslims are doing side projects, side hustles, looking at different sources of income because we have to, right? Anyone, has anyone here ever volunteered at like a food bank or a food pantry? The people who come, mashallah, this young sister, mashallah, the people who come are not what we think of as the poor. There are people who have jobs, who may show up even in like a really expensive car, but are still struggling paycheck to paycheck. So even what we think of as poverty has changed in America. 
Um, and then a last question I want to ask. Has anyone heard the name Nasrat Ahmed Yar? Munir, have you heard this name before? Anyone here? You want to guess? No, okay, no problem, right? So this brother um, was a Afghani national who served with U.S. Special Forces in Afghanistan in the military. He was also an interpreter. He was very well loved and liked by the people he served with. He came to the U.S. two years ago from Afghanistan. Same thing, right? And the only job he could find was driving for Lyft, okay? And then a few months ago, he was murdered by teenagers while driving Lyft. Okay, so, huh? He's like in his 30s, late 30s. I mean, he's younger than me, I know that. And the kids who uh, uh, attacked him were all teenagers. So a 15 year old was charged in his death. Inna lillahi wa lillahi rajiun, right? Now I'm sharing that incident with you to say that there's an argument that the reason why refugees are often forced into Uber and Lyft is because there are not great jobs available for them. So this is well documented. What happens in a lot of resettlement cases is that someone comes from another country, maybe they have an MD, maybe they're a doctor, but the certification in America is insane. Like the only US state that ha like actually even allows undocumented people to apply for certification, right, is Washington state, but they've actually made it easier now for people from other countries to apply for jobs. It's the only U.S. state that really does it. And the reason I bring that up is we have a big problem. People come from other countries, they can't get work, and they're often put in jobs that are demeaning, right? The number one place, I don't know how many people know this, where refugees often work is meat processing, chicken processing, right? Where someone who has gone to college is now slaughtering chickens or cows for meat. And it's very dangerous work. It has no benefits. And it's a very hard life, right? And there's so many better jobs. So I want to wrap up and say this, that where I would love to see Muslims get more involved, including us, we can start the conversation here. I'm sure MCC is already doing this, but we can do more, is we really need to come together to come up with organizations that get Muslims better jobs. And I want to acknowledge this organization, Tent, tent.org. Their focus in the United States and globally is connecting refugees to work. So what they do is they have established um, toolkits to help companies attract refugees and to get refugees to think about work in certain companies. Like I heard, I think it might be Tesla, right? Tesla apparently employs a lot of refugees in the Sacramento area or near Vacaville, right, from what I've heard. But there are other examples. Of course, the story of Chobani, right, in New York was founded by a Kurdish Muslim refugee, right? And they also employ a lot of refugees. So people are doing it, but we can do more. So I just want to wrap up with this. Is, um, this is a great poem by Faisal Mohideen, who said, How can the human heart, without ripping away at the seams, ever house the immeasurable heartache of one's own history? Every life carries a library of loss. And I just want to say that if any good has come from this talk, it is because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If any bad has come, it's because of my own shortcomings. Please forgive me. Here is a digital business card. I would love to stay in touch with everyone. Jazakallah khair. Thank you for coming. <laughs> so. Okay. so I have a mic, inshallah, and I travel around the room. So just raise your hand. And also, I guess you have to monitor. Yeah, I'll monitor the questions online. And those that are watching online, please put in the chat box there. We'll, we'll get the question answered, inshallah. We are pushing against Maghrib time here, so we'll be quick if we do do questions, inshallah. We're just about 10 minutes away from Maghrib. Okay. Do you have a question? No. I did have one question, it's pro yes, probably sir. pretty semantical, but uh, semantic, but uh, what's the difference between an immigrant and a refugee? That's a good one. Um, maybe I should have clarified that earlier. So um, I'll also say this, Munir, is that when you think about immigrant, usually what we understand in the United States is that an immigrant is someone who's coming here permanently. Right. That's usually the understanding is that um, immigrants and the U.S. has a huge visa classification system for non-immigrants versus immigrants. So a non-immigrant might be coming here for school, might be coming for business, might be coming for diplomatic reasons, but it's usually short term. An immigrant, the implication is that someone is coming here long term. So all refugees are immigrants, but not all immigrants are refugees. For example, my parents came as immigrants. My dad came in August. 1974, so this year will be 50 years from India to be a doctor. He came as an immigrant. He wasn't fleeing anything, right? 
He had a good life in India, but he wanted more opportunities here. But refugees are immigrants who are fleeing political violence because of their partisan beliefs, because of their religious beliefs. They cannot be in the country of origin and they want to come to a new place. I also want to acknowledge that only 1% of all refugees ever get resettled in a third country. In fact, most refugees often stay displaced. So a lot of people never become refugees. For example, what's happening right now in Palestine and Israel is that because Palestinians are often not recognized as Israeli citizens, they are now displaced within the country, cannot go to their homes, don't want to leave, so they may be forever kind of stuck there. So they were called IDPs. Most people actually never become a refugee. They just get displaced within their country. And we know that in Afghanistan and Pakistan as well. For decades now, people have been displaced within their country, can't go back, but they can't leave either. They're essentially imprisoned. So thank you for that question. Any other questions before Maghrib, inshallah? Jazakallah khair. May Allah bless you. A very comprehensive uh, presentation. We appreciate that. Well, let me go back to the first one. I'll just keep my email up here. And if anyone wants to stay in touch, um, happy to. Email is right there. And um, yes, inshallah, maybe we can do this again in the future, especially closer to the election. Um, and yeah, I'd love to stay in touch with anyone, inshallah. So, Jazakallah khair. Thank you. Thank you, Munir. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, we're still live.